Yes, sir. This meeting is being recorded. Yes, sir. Sorry, everyone, for the delay. Technology at its best, you know. So, as I was saying, I want to quickly look at some of the applications of X rays that we have that we might come across in our practice, though we might not necessarily use all of them. So, um, I said I would start off with um, abdominal X ray. And uh, abdominal X ray is the indications for which you would want to do an ab uh, abdominal X ray, include an acute abdomen. And I'm sure you all know what acute abdomens are. I want people coming with severe abdominal pain um, along with other signs and symptoms. Good, um, like those acute abdominal pain. And these could be due to either bowel penetration, intestinal obstruction, um, kidney stones, or other foreign bodies. Okay, so these are five um, common indications for which we usually request abdominal x ray abdominal x-ray. So remember this, five indications for abdominal x-ray. Okay. Then next, thank you. Yes, so I have to resume it here now. Okay, how do I see? Yes, so if you have an abdominal x-ray, this is just a simple scheme for going through so as not to miss anything at this um, stage. So you look at the bones, the ribs, the vesicular spine, and upper femur. These are the main things that are glaring at you on the x ray. So you start from there. You look at the lung bases, which will also be visible. And um, you look out for um, you know, various opacifications, which are the, you know, the major organs in the abdomen. All right. Importantly, you look out for that in the bowel, look at a few of them. And then also you look out for any abnormal masses that may show up on the x-ray. All right. So this is um, just a picture of the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the bony aspect of the abdomen that usually comes with the x-ray. So the, uh, the pubic bone, the femur, the hip joint here, the sacrum there, the uh, lower lumbar vertebrae, and all of that are shown in here. Now, for the soft tissues, which are our area of concern here, so if you ask for a KUB, kidney ureter bladder, this is what you are likely to get. Okay, this is what you are most likely to get. And um, um, I don't know how well it's showing on your screen, but the, uh, there are some organs showing in here. Now, let's start from the bone. If you take the pelvic uh, bone here, the, the, the vertebrae that you see on it, if you start counting from the very first one on it, you know the lumbar vertebrae has five um, the lumbar spine has five vertebrae. So the one that is on the sacrum or on the pelvis should be L5. So that means that even though it's not labeled, or if, whether it's labeled or not, the one that is on the pelvis is L5. So then this means that the next one above it will be L4. The one above it will be L3, like that. Okay, so if I'm looking for L3, I just count upwards. So this is L5, L4, L3, and then I identify my L3. Uh, hey, so on this one, I can't use Keza. I'll ask him in. What do I do now? But I'm uh, sure so you are following like that. Now, hey, okay, so if you look at the top right of the image, you see the, the left kidney showing somewhere here. I don't know whether I can see the outline. Since my Keza is not working with me, I don't know. Um, then also on the left, the left kidney, which will also show you, okay, and parts of the psoas muscle in there. But when you get the, the slides, um, which I'll send right after the class, please look at them carefully. So um, most uh, kidney stones are radiopaque, 
and that is why we can use x-ray to identify them so somebody comes to you um, with severe abdominal pain which is radiating all the way from the abdomen down to the groin which is a typical uh, presentation for um ureteral colic okay it's colic abdominal pain that radiates from the abdomen into the, into the uh, groin okay and the person typically cannot stay still they are rolling around rolling unlike someone who has peritonitis who is likely to be lying still okay so um in such um a presentation you want to do kub and look out for stones which will be in the region of the uh, kidney and the ureter or even the bladder all right so there's also another diagram that tries to give you um, a schematic representation of where you will find the various organs in the body okay so acute abdomen as i said earlier i said uh, uh, condition of severe abdominal pain usually requiring emergency surgery caused by acute disease or injury to internal organs so um, one of them is bowel perforation so when someone has um perforated duodenal ulcer okay so someone has a long-standing history of peptic ulcer and one day something comes with severe epigastric pain with other signs of acute abdomen then you think of a bowel perforation and you are likely to do um, and you have to do abdominal x-ray so we diagnose bowel perforation by seeing air under the diaphragm above the liver when we did uh, x-rays remember that the space on the right below the right side of the diaphragm because the liver is there there's usually no air there it is rather on the left side of the um, under part of the diaphragm that you see the gastric bubble from the from the stomach. So normally you shouldn't see air on the right side. Okay. So when you are seeing that in the setting of an acute abdomen, then the patient is likely to have a perforated bowel. However, other procedures such as HSG and laparoscopy introduce air into the abdomen and in the erect position they will end up going to rest under the diaphragm on the right just above the lip so we'll look at a few pictures Yes, so you can see that the you can see that the heart is here. So this is the left side, okay. But on the right side also, you see that there's some, um, you know, radio lucency under the right diaphragm. Can you all see that? I hope you can all appreciate it. Yes, sir. Now, the image on the right also has a similar phenomenon, okay. So also on the right here, you realize that there's air under the diaphragm. So this is how air under the diaphragm will look like. Though it may not be so big, sometimes it will just show as a small, tiny black line on the, uh, what do you call it, on your X-ray. Uh, so what's happening to my... All right, so this is how air under the diaphragm would look like. Are we all okay or not? All right. Then the other thing is for, um, that we can also see is in the setting of intestinal fraction. So someone is presenting to you with absolute constipation for about three or four days the abdomen is distended you do the um, um, abdominal x-rays now what you need to know for abdominal x-rays is that you always do an erect and supine erect and supine mm -hmm. 
erect and supine. The erect supine, that is the patient standing erect, you see air fluid levels. In that the dilated loops of bowel, uh, you see that the fluid will settle and there will be air above the fluid. That is what you call air fluid level. Then on the supine, where the patient is lying flat, you see the dilated loops of bowel. Okay, so I have a picture here. Yes, so now this is a patient of someone who had a zygmoid volvoli, that is twisting of the zygmoid colon on itself. You would see here that on the erect one, which is on the right, yes, no, the erect one on the left, you see that there are multiple air fluid levels. Okay, so you see a radio opacity down here, and then there's air above it, radio opacity air above it, like that, it's multiple all the way through. Okay, so that is the erect. Um, hold on. Okay. Just hold on. So as I was saying, oh, sorry, I've just been called for an emergency on my word. Um, okay. And my phone is not working, so I can't call my house officers. So the and the erect one, as I said, will show you air fluid level. And then the supine, which is on the right, will show you dilated loops of bowel. My phone is not working yet. Let me call you with my wife's phone. Please just hang the line. I'll call you with my wife's phone. But there's a patient. Um, this uh, meeting is being recorded. Yeah, so um, as I was saying, for intestinal obstructions, you need um, at least two views that is, erect and supine x The erect one will show you just the air fluid levels that confirm that you have an obstruction because fluid is not moving or the contents of the bowel are not moving. So you see that showing. And also if you look at the picture, I can see that the abdomen is distended. If you look at the, the sides of it, they're distended. Then the supine um, one shows you the bowel that is dilated. So typically when um, bowel is dilated, um, this is how it looks like on the right, as you can see. Okay, so that is it. So um, that is so. This is how a zygmoid will look like. So there's the bowel that is dilated. There's a way the ileum will move. There's a way the zygmoid will look and so on. And then uh, you take those up as you move along with your um, practice. But basically, for you to do that, if you are suspecting intestinal obstruction, then you um, have to do abdominal x-rays, all right, erect and supine, good. 
Now, this is what I was talking about. So we move on to kidney stones, kidney stones. So these are three images that show examples of kidney stones. So someone has come with you with presentation of plantain or pain radiating the groin, blah, blah, blah. So you, um, you uh, what do you call it? You do the kidney, you eat bladder of KUB, and you see the stones. So I'm sure you can all see the stones in the, in the region of the kidney area. Okay. Sometimes they might be along the pulse of the ureter. I have to run, so pardon my speed. But I hope this is, I mean, this is simple enough, isn't it? Self-explanatory. And this is a child who has swallowed some foreign bodies, as I mentioned earlier. So there's a child who has swallowed some coins. So an x-ray was done, and lo and behold, the coins are sitting in the stomach, OK? Typically, with these ones, you would just continue monitoring for a while and the child is likely to pass it out if she doesn't end up with them. Um, in, uh, what do you call it? A small fraction or anything like that. Right. Then we move on to spine x-rays. Spine x-rays. OK, so for spine x-rays, you just need to know a bit of the anatomy first. Now, the spine x-ray, uh, the x-ray, sorry, I mean the spine is divided into the cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine, okay, and the sacral region. The cervical spine has a normal lordosis, that is, it is curved forward. The thoracic spine is curved backward, that is a normal kyphosis. And the lumbar spine also, again, has lordosis. So when the spine, the, the bending forward of the spine also refers to lordosis. The, the bending backwards is the kyphosis. So we know that at various points, it may be normal. All right? So that is it. So we'll look at some x-rays here. Now, this is how a normal x-ray of the spine looks like. So you can see that if you look at the, as I said, two views, AP and lateral, OK? If you're examining the spine, it's AP and lateral. So you can see um, these, what do you call it? These um, vertebral bones here, the spaces in between are occupied by cartilage. And as we know, cartilage will not show on an x-ray. Um, the one on the right is a lateral view, and you can still see the spaces separated out. And the lordosis of the lumbar, this is the lumbar region. It is the lumbar region because this is the sacrum. Okay, so if this is the sacrum, that means this is the one above is L5, above is L4, L3, L2, L1, like that, going upwards. I hope you are following me. Okay. And this is also an x-ray of the cervical spine. You can note that it is curved. And I hope you can all see the trachea beautifully uh, sitting in the middle of this um, vertebra here. So if you're examining a spine x-ray, so typically someone comes with to you with severe lower back pain, you know, that's usually what they present with. So what you are looking out for is the normal curvature. You expect the cervical spine to be normally low dose, the thoracic to be kyphos, the lumbar should be um, low dose also. So that if the curvature is, is not there, some x-rays when you do, they realize that the spine is almost straight those are also a cause of back pain. If the intervertebral spaces are reduced or too widened, that could also be a source of pain. If the vertebral bodies are fractured or have osteophytes on them, those are also sorts of pain. So those are the things you look out for on a spine x-ray. So let's look at some of them. Now, this x-ray is of someone's spine. And you realize that it is this is a pelvic bone here, and we are looking at the pelvic bone AP view. So that tells us this is an AP X-ray, and also looking at the ribs here, you can tell that this is an AP view of somebody's spine. And I'm sure you can all tell that this, uh, what do you call it? this spine is crooked. Okay, so it is not straight. If you are looking AP, you see that this is not straight. Then this is scoliosis, scoliosis. And if you watch closely, you realize that. The intervertebral space is not uh, is flattened out. 
and then on the this is L5, L4, L3, L2. So between L3 and L2 on the left side here, I'm sure you cannot see that the space there is almost absent. The bones have stuck together. All right. Hold on. on my way all right so as i was saying yes yeah, so this is an abnormal x-ray okay so the joint space are not there the curvature is also bad you know and there are some osteophytes also on this x-ray right. now this is also another x-ray now if you look at the and this is a, 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 a lateral view this is a lateral view of the spine if you look at the anterior borders of the vertebral body you realize that there are some sharp, sharp projections coming out, out of it. These are, uh, what do you call it? These are, these are called osteophytes, 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 okay? So these are sharp projections of the, the uh, what do you call it, spine that are able to cause soft tissue pain, okay? So these would be pinging on surrounding tissues, therefore causing pain in the body. Um, yeah, so there's also another one. You can see osteophytes on the anterior body here. And the vertebral bodies appear to be flattened out. So all of these could be sources of pain. This is another x-ray here. You see that this is L5, L4, L3, L2. If you look at L2, you can see that the, the fracture is compressed. The fracture is compressed. Okay? Um, okay. So that is one. Okay. Um, I'll give you the slides, eh? so let me just run through. Um, so th there's something called rule of twos in X-ray. There's something called rule of twos in X-ray. That is uh, more of an algorithm that we use to help us make more sense of X-rays. You know, X-rays give us more of a two-dimensional, or let me say one-dimensional image. So this is uh, some of the ways by which we make more sense of it. Now, when you are doing x-rays, typically of long bones and the rest, always try and get two views. That is an AP and lateral view. That gives you at least a two-dimensional photo. Okay? Um, I have some pictures that will elaborate on that. So that is, so rule of twos. Rule one is two views. If possible, get an AP and lateral. Rule two, try and get two limbs. If you have an x-ray uh, of one knee, and you are not sure whether it's normal, you can compare it to the other normal knee, which has no problem. Also, in children, because of the facial plates in there, sometimes when you do x rays, um, they might appear as if they are fractures. But if you compare it to the other normal one, then you realize that that is how the thing is. It's not an abnormality. I've seen people refer children to me with fractures. Um, meanwhile, they were looking at actually at. Um, uh, uh, Facial uh, fleas. Uh, okay. Next. Yes. Then two occasions. Sometimes when it is not very clear whether it is a problem or not, then if the person had a previous X-ray or older X-rays of that same part, then you might want to compare them. Or sometimes the patient might have to repeat it in a few weeks or months time or a few days time let's remember however that because of radiations if it is not necessary you shouldn't subject the patient but if necessary you may have to compare two different x-rays a previous one or a subsequent one now also in fracture of long bones it is very common for uh, the joints that are closest to 
uh, the long bones will also be affected. So if you are looking at a fracture of the of the tibia or the femur, you should also have X-rays, including the joint above and the joint below, to be able to uh, rule out a problem with them because commonly they are implicated when there's a fracture. The the other one here, uh -huh. so there's a typical example of why you need two views. Now, if you look at the x-ray on the x-ray B, you realize that it looks as if there's nothing going on. The person came with a severe knee pain after falling from a motorbike. If you look at the image B, it's like there's nothing wrong. But if you look at the AP view, the, the image B is AP view, the image A is a lateral view. So if you look at the lateral view, you can see that it's a fracture. But if you have done only an, a, uh, an AP view, you wouldn't see this. Then you tell the person that you are fine, go home, and the patient will go and die from severe bleeding. Okay, so this is why you need AP view. So for all long bones, all long bones, the humerus, the I mean the forearm, the arm, the leg, the thigh, always have an AP and lateral view, as well as their joints, AP and lateral view. I hope this point is well made. Another one is here. If you see the image on the left, it looks like all is well. But if you look at the image on the uh, on the right, you realize that the person has a dislocation of the uh, of the interphalangeal joint. So this is why, for all long bones, you should always get an AP and lateral view. I hope I am stressing this enough. Now, then we also coin. Uh, Uh -huh. Yes, there is something we call barium studies. Now, these are studies in which you want to um, have a fair outline of the uh, GIT. I'm sure you've done it in surgery. Um, when you suspect some problems with the lumen of the bowel, these are what you do. So the barium is just uh, barium sulfate. It's a substance that is radio opaque. So it's usually makes in fluid given for you to swallow or to have as an enema and so on. And then we take subsequent x-rays and it helps us to delineate the bowel well. So we have barium swallow, barium meal, barium meal followed to small bowel enema, barium enema. So we give it the patient to do an x-ray. And these are some of the images. So this patient here, they were suspecting um, uh, the image showing here is the stomach, okay? So the pyloric thing, uh, the duodenal sphincter here, the pyloric sphincter here. But if you look at the top part where the um, the antrum thereabouts, you can see that, I mean, the fundus of the stomach, you can see that there's a filling defect. A filling defect simply means that there's a point where there is no any uh, barium. The barium didn't reach somewhere here. That means that there's a tumor here. So this is what you see. This is showing a gastric tumor sitting in the fundus of the uterus. I hope it is clear. The whole of the fight you are seeing is the barium. That's how to show on an x-ray, just for you to get the idea how this looks like. Good. Now, this is also another one of the stomach again. Now, this picture here shows, um, uh, what do you call it? Pyloric stenosis. Pyloric stenosis. So you can see that this is the stomach at where it's supposed to That's why it's supposed to enter into the small intestine. Realize that there's a filling defect here. There's no filling of the uh, there's no filling of the barium in that section there, and the rest of it enters into the a small amount enters into the first part of the duodenum. So this is how um, uh, pyloric stenosis would look like. It wouldn't be too different from um, what do you call this one from duodenal atresia. All right, so this is also another one here. So this is um, the large bowel. So you can see on the left side is the ascending colon. The top part is the transverse colon. And the descending part is the, I mean, the descending colon. So you can see that there's a filling defect all the way here. You see that the, the barium where the arrow is, um, is not filling the whole of the fluid. That is likely because there's constriction, likely due to a colonic tumor. 
Okay, this there is a tumor in there, so it's not allowing the embryo to fill in nicely. So it's that it becomes small as it passes through. Then the last one we'll talk about is HSG. So HSG is um, an imaging that we use to determine the frequency of the tubes and the uterus. Okay, so for that also we pass dye into the vagina through the cervix, and we take X-rays to see. So this is a normal. HSG, where you can see the tube being filled with the dye, and then the tubes are also filled with the dye nicely like that. And the dye has also spilled into the abdomen, indicating that the tubes are patent. And then the, these here are abnormal HSGs. So you realize that with the one on the left, there is what we call hydrosalping. That means that the tubes are very much dilated and they are filled with fluid. So that is what is showing on the HSG. You can see that the uterus is filled and then the rest of the tubes are grossly dilated. Now, if you look at the one on the right, you see that it has um, the uterus is here and um, the uterus is here and it is not filled. I mean, the, the, the tubes are not showing. So this is how um, blocked tubes will look like, okay?